molecular machines. They do all the work of life, and Professor Vachu has been studying them for many years, first at Baylor University and then lately at SLAC, uh, a facility is developing here on Crow EM in minor detail. He wants, he's, he's going to show us today how they are put together, how they work, how they do all the work that life does. So, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very nice of you to uh, come out this evening uh, to join me uh, to uh, listen to the kind of work I've been doing in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And so I am a professor at uh, Photon Science here at SLAC and also uh, in the bioengineering in the engineering school as well as the microbiology and immunology in the medical school at Stanford. So first of all, I kind of like to make an introduction. What do we mean by molecular machines and what is really cryo-EM? And so here is the work molecular machine being introduced by Professor Bruce Albert at University of California in San Francisco Medical School. And he draw an analogy of molecular machine to a man-made machine. As you can imagine, a man-made machine, just like an automobile, is made up of many parts. Each of these parts has to work cooperative and it's a dynamic process, it's not sitting still. So a molecular machine in a living system is also making up many parts, but those parts are proteins and nucleic acids. And all these parts has uh, to put into the right place and has to move at the right time. So, so these are the challenge about uh, how these molecular machines are being together and how they function in the cell. And I would say that there are only finite numbers of molecular machines in the living systems. So as a biologist, we are interested to understand each of these molecular machines. Once we understand it, just like car, if we know everything about different parts of the car, we know how to fix it. Actually, I have a broken automobile now. I don't understand enough about the car, so I couldn't drive it, right? So these the same principles. And so here is an example of a molecular machine. It's a protein folding machine. And this little orange color thing is a protein that's first made in the cell. But when it first made in the cell, just like spaghetti is a, a string of, of uh, protein, uh, uh, amino acids, but somehow it had to get into the chamber and there's a biochemical process. And at the end, it would come up with with a, a, a functional protein. Just like you have a chicken, you put it in an oven, somehow it works and it come out, it's, it actually tastes good. So, so this machine, protein machine, is the one that made up of, it look like sausage, but you know, it looks a, 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 a sausage looking density, which is a protein components. And this particular protein machine is made up of 14 different uh, protein components. So the question is, as I saw in the movie, uh, they can move, in, something coming in, and something coming out with, with a products. So now, what are the size of a protein machine uh, in, in living systems? So the size is around between 10 nanometer and 100 nanometer. Uh, the nanometer is a measure of a scale. Uh, one angstrom, which is the size of an atom, is equivalent to 0.1 nanometer, which is, approximately, is exactly one billionth of a meter. So a molecular machine is a, a, a range in this range scale between 10 nanometer and 100 nanometer. So it's about 100 times bigger than any single atoms. It's 100 times smaller than a bacteria cell. Now the question is how we can visualize such a, a molecular machine. And, and then the way to do it is use a HI microscope. Now the bigger object we are familiar like a hair, uh, or a bacteria, we can use a light microscope to see it. And other techniques to see these all these objects of different sizes, in addition to a electron microscope, we can actually use a photon. Like for example, SLAC is, uh, uh, is internationally known to have a very powerful uh, uh, photon source. In such a way, we can, def we can scatter uh, the atoms or the proteins uh, 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 by, by the X-ray to get uh, very high resolution structures of proteinist materials.
But today, I'm going to tell you using an electron, uh, the advantage to do electron rather than x-ray, number one, uh, it's scattered very powerfully. So uh, we can actually, the wavelength of the electron is less than a fraction of the enzymes. So the resolutions uh, of a electron microscope can and visualize down to a atomic levels. And secondly, uh, using electron, we don't need to crystallize the material like in the case of X-ray. Uh, we usually have to crystallize the material in order uh, to depict its uh, detailed structures. Uh, so the, the molecular machine that I'm going to talk to you today is turned out to be a virus. Okay, uh, virus, I think you all probably have experienced the infection during the season, the flu virus. And the virus is really a, a some very tiny amount of genetic material, either DNA and RNA, and being encapsulated by a protein cell. So the question the biologists is interested to in know is how exactly these protein cells are being organized. It turned out the virus, in fact, you and me, are different from the virus, in fact, the bacteria, or in fact, the cow or, or, the, or the dog. So you know, different virus has different uh, chemical composition, and the shapes and the size of the virus are also different. So what I'm going to tell you today is one type of virus, how it looks in atomic details. Uh, which is at this uh, size scale uh, is a, uh, a, a, a about 70 uh, nanometer in diameter. Uh, so now, what is a electron microscope? I mentioned the word electron microscope. It looks something like this. Uh, in fact, it's, it's about 10 feet tall. And then if you open the door of this, you see a whole bunch of, again, it's a machine, so it lots of parts. And those parts uh, is fundamentally can be classified as uh, several components. The electron has to come out from the top here. In other words, you have the accelerator, so the electron do have certain energy. Now, a electron is, you can think about electron as a wave or as a particle. Uh, so because it has a mass as well as a charge. Okay, just the, you know, the electricity electron, so you have charge. So the electron is accelerating extremely high energy. The typical energy of the electron we use in a electron microscope is around 300 kilo electron volt. So, and then you come down to through these columns of, uh, of what we call lenses. So what the lens does is to control uh, the flux of the electron. In other words, just like you turn on the faucet, how much water it come out. So you know, all the lenses can regulate how much electron can be irradiating on uh, on the top of the specimen. This tiny arrow is represent the position we put our biological specimen or whatever specimen that one is interested to look at. And then after the specimens, then one need to form an image. And the image is formed by a electromagnetic lens. Now, it turns out electron doesn't go on straight line. It has to go on a kind of spiral way that is where the lenses are, so that in such a way we form the first image. Now, part of the use uh, of a microscope is to magnify it so that we can see it, right? So there are many lenses uh, below this first lens called objective lens is to magnify the objects at different uh, uh, stage of, uh, of, of, of sizes. And at the end, after that, we still need, we, uh, we need to record the image so we can see it. So this is where the detector is. So these are basic components of electron microscope. Now, then the question is, it sounds pretty good because the electron microscope, as I said, the wavelength is better than a fraction of enzymes, so we can resolve things at atomic level. But then, can we use the electron microscope to look at biological material? The answer is going to be, it was, it was very tough because the electrons has to be in a vacuum. The electron is so energetic, so it has to put in a vacuum so there's no gas molecule in the path of the electrons. Uh, now, where is a vacuum? That means if you have biological material, they are full of water. So that means it has to be dry. And when it's dry, it means dead, right? If your plant has no water, it's dead, right? In the drought season, you know, last few years, you know, all the plants dying because they're dry. And then, so there's no good news. So somehow we have to find a way to keep the specimen wet with the water inside the microscope. The biology have figured out how to do that. And secondly, the electron, as I said, is very energetic. By energetic means they would damage it. 
So the electron has energy, and it will depart some energy into the material, and as a result, the chemical bonds that make up all the proteins or the genetic material will be damaged by the electron beam. So these are two bad news for the biology if we will look at the biological materials. Now, let me just damage what the damage means. So here is an organic metallic crystals. Each the white dot is a cluster of, of molecules. You can see they are very periodic way. So if we give the, this specimen only a few electrons, it look really ordinary way <coughs> in the image. But if you flux it with a lot of hundreds of electrons per square and some, some of these periodicity uh, arrangements will be destroyed. That's what I mean by damage. You want to look at the native structure of your objects if you give it two electrons, you destroy it, right? So that means the biology have figured out what's a limit the specimen can tolerate the electrons so that you won't be damaged with before, uh, we, we, before we record the images. Uh, so we have figured out a way to do that. So now, now the term beside the electron, I call cryo electron microscopy. Cryo electron microscopy, what does that mean? What it really means is the biological specimen will be kept at really low temperature, minus 195 degrees Celsius inside the microscope. Now, why we keep the specimen at this low temperature? Because the two problems I pointed out, the damage and in a vacuum. So because the ability to keep the specimen at low temperature, we can actually freeze the specimen. Uh, the freezing, it means just like uh, we punch frozen uh, the specimen and make the water in ice. So you can imagine if you go to have a hamburger, the hamburger is a protein, you want to put ketchup and mayonnaise and all the other goodies, and those are watery material. That's exactly what we do, is when we prepare our specimen, we freeze it uh, so that all the water, all the salt buffer surrounding the biological material are still in the environment uh, so once it's frozen, we put it in the electron microscope, and the electron microscope have a low temperature specimen holder so that the specimen can be kept at what, minus 190 degrees Celsius. So that's, that's the first experiment we did. And then secondly, at low temperature, even the specimen are damaged by the electron as long as the molecule or the atom do not move away we still can see what are the position of all the atoms uh, in, in the biological material. So, so that is the merge of going to low temperature, keep the specimen hydrated so that we preserve the specimen or also reduce its radiation damage. So that is why we call cryo electron microscopy. Now, so now in terms of the whole workflow, how, what I do in a daily basis uh, here at Stanford, uh, so first, some of us will prepare the biological material. It depends on who you are. Some, uh, some of us interest in protein related to cancer, and other interest in protein uh, related to Alzheimer. So or other just for curiosity, just any protein to uh, metabolize the, the meal you just finished, you know. And so, so the, you can choose whatever protein that from this protein uh, molecular machine. So once it's purified uh, in the wet lab, then we freeze the specimen. This is apparatus, so we quick freeze it very quickly, just like a gelatin. You know, just push the button, and then the drop of uh, of the of the solution of the your protein machine will be punched in the cryogen. We froze it uh, in a matrix of very thin layers of ice. Okay, so once this is formed, then we transfer the specimen in this microscope, which I have a, a slide earlier. And in the microscope, what we did in forming an interest, something like that. It's not very appealing, you know, it's just black and white, it's not even color. But what we do is all the objects is in three dimensions. And so in the electron microscope is we are looking at a projection. Uh, of a three-dimensional object. So like here, uh, you know, just like, just like a, 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 a ping-pong ball right here in these pictures. Now, these are two-dimensional images, but what we are really interested are the three-dimensional look of all the atoms in space. So that is the next step is we call image processing. Uh, we actually borrow the, 
the method used by the astronomers and the, uh, and then the signal processing uh, engineer, and in such a way that we can combine all these images of this little round particle and create its three-dimensional picture. Just like if, if we have to take a CT scan in a hospital, you know, we have all the picture that uh, in that case, uh, the camera can rotate. They don't rotate us as a patient, but the camera rotate at different angle. If you want to look at me in three dimension, you really need to look at me in all angle. So, there, so what the image processing does is look at this round particle in different angle, so it can generate a three dimensional pictures. Now, since any a typical uh, molecular machine, uh, they have thousands of atoms. So it's all in here. Can't you see an atom? Some of you say yes. Not really. They are there. So in order to see where they are, we need to simplify it so any decent intelligent individual like me can actually interpret it. So we call modeling. So in other words, we put the atom in a schematic way so we can actually understand how they look, which I'll show you how they look in a minute. And subsequently, when we finish, since we thank you very much for your tax data for us to do research, we want to share our knowledge to the global scientific community. So as a result of that, we have the protein data bank uh, that we deposit all this information uh, in the data bank in such a way anybody, anywhere, you have an internet, you can just put a click and you can get a structure I solve, it, so you can get a structure my competitors solve. So I think that is a very genuine community. We share our data openly when we finish our work. So these are the whole pipeline. Now, it sounds pretty straightforward. In fact, it took about 40 years for some of us involved in each of these steps. Uh, we have, uh, I, when I was a graduate student across the Bay at Berkeley, we are actually the first one involved in these freezing steps. And then we, I, in my group, we actually done a lot of implementations uh, of this software, which I put an arrow because I had a lot of many, many years before we can go from one side of the arrow to the other side. And so again, all our software that we did have in our lab also openly share with the global community as well. So with all this work uh, in our lab and in, in, in several labs in, 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 uh, in the world, and finally this field become mature. And last year we say we actually touched down and three of my friends uh, uh, have won the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry in recognition about their substantial contribution in different aspects of cryo -EM. And so, in fact, uh, Richard Henderson will be visiting us in November uh, this year. So any one of you will be interested in this lecture, I welcome you to come on November 9th uh, on campus. So now, with that, the question is why all of a sudden 27 the Nobel Prize was given because the Nobel Committee actually looked at what the trend of this field goes. Uh, so this shows in the last 10 years, what are the structures being solved in the global community? As you can see, since 2014, there's a big jump. All of a sudden, all these structures emerge not only in my lab, which in the 2008 and 2000, most of these 50% are come from my lab, but now in the last few years so from many labs, not in, including our as well. So I think with this urge of, of, uh, of interest uh, in multiple places in Europe, and the question is what are the situation why not only me who can do it which i would like to see it that way but on the other way on the other uh, on the other way we want to of the technology we share the, with all the other was primarily due to the invention of this camera so as i point out you need to record the images now in the old days some of you uh, as well as I am, when you take a picture, you bought a Kodak photographic film and you went to the dark room and then you, you developed the film. That's what I used to do. When I was a, a assistant professor, I actually make our own photographic film so that it becomes sensitive enough. Now, through all this year, they're actually electron detectors. Uh, first, with the called CCD camera, uh, the other called direct detection camera. And direct detection camera basically is similar in physics, just like your iPhone. But the only difference is these are cost more than half million dollars a piece than the iPhone. So that's only different. The physics are very similar. Uh, so now, why is that useful? And it turned out 
this, this camera that, uh, it, in fact, it was developed by the uh, detector in, in, a, in, a, in a lab similar to here, the Berkeley and, uh, lab, uh, in the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And so, and subsequently picked up by, uh, by a number of uh, industrial uh, companies that make it uh, commercially available. Uh, the, the, the scientific merit of this camera is it's a very high frame rate. It turned out one of the challenges in using a electron is when the electron hitting the specimen, the specimen will be moving. Just like if you take a picture of a baby or me at this point, then you will have a fuzzy picture, right? So now, but if your camera is very high speed, then you can take multiple pictures of me, and subsequently you can use the computer to align one frame to another. And so this is what this picture shows it. You can actually align multiple frames uh, in such a way you will reduce all this blurring effect due to motion of the specimen caused by the electrons. Now, the other scientific merit of this detector is it can count single electrons. So that means it's extremely efficient. They, don't, they waste no uh, electron. Every electron coming in, they actually count it. So they form useful uh, images. So because of this, uh, it really is, the, the microscope turned out to be very darn good for many, many years because the optic, optical uh, uh, electron microscopy developed those uh, optics very nicely but we were not able to record the images good enough until in the last few years. So I think these are the technological breakthrough. I just want to point out what we get the camera today is not reaching the limits of the physics yet. That means that's why we still need to do the research to get to push on for the next generations of camera. And so this, that means this field is still under active research. So now, so this that much technology I want to share with you. Now, I want to give you some uh, real life uh, applications. So for many years, my lab has been interested in a biological process. The process involved is how the virus are being put together in a living system. So it turned out the virus is once you get one virus get into, then you will multiple, multiply many, many virus and that you, you know, the, the, the organism get infected will get sick. So in what part of the process is that the virus has the genome and the genome will be replicated in the infected cell and then, and then the replicated genome will produce proteins and the protein will put it uh, together in, in a particles. Now there has different color, different color represent different types of protein that make up this uh, particular shell or, or particles. And then subsequently, the DNA in this particular virus will thread through one of the, 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 the vertex and then the gas boo around inside the chamber. So if the outsides are all made of protein. So, uh, so the water protein in the virus actually protect the genome so that makes sure the genome of the virus are not being chewed up. Uh, by the host enzymes, okay? So this is very important for the job, if you have a virus, that you have to have the right protein to encapsulate the right size. It turned out interesting enough, some virus are big, some are small. And for some, uh, for, for good strategic reason of the virus, the, the chamber, uh, uh, the size of the chamber inside the, the, the protein are exactly the right side to hold the, the viral genome. So it's a, it's a very uh, 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 precise process. So when this is formed, then where the entry point of the, of the genome will be sealed all by additional protein, we call tail, and as a result, these things sticking out would be, become infectious, can attach to the surface uh, of the cell, and then it will then the genome will be released in the cell and then make the next rounds of replication. So that's the whole process. Now the tremendous genetics and biochemistry has been known in this process. However, there's no information how this virus looks like. Okay, as I pointed out, in order to get the structure, you can do X-ray crystallography. And in this particular virus uh, called P22 uh, bacteriophage, uh, this P22 phase turned out to be a virus that can infect the salmonella. Now, salmonella, some of you may have heard, can be a food poisoning. Uh, if you somehow go to some junky place to eat the thing and you have food poisoning with salmonella, so now the, how do you solve the problem? Uh, I would suggest maybe you eat some of this phage. 
okay, because the phage will kill the bacteria, and then you'll be well again. Now, that is not a crazy idea, because you think about, you heard about, about bacterial infection, you, you know, the last thing you want to go, to go is go to the hospital when you're sick, because there are lots of infection can possibly be done. Those are the bacteria. So once you have bacterial infection, what do you do? You would actually have antibiotics, right? But sometimes antibiotic doesn't work. So in fact, the Russian has suggested many, many years ago, maybe a phage therapy. You know, if you somehow feed the, the patient with some phage, maybe you can kill the, the bacteria rather than antibiotic. Now, that was, I thought was crazy idea many years ago, but now, maybe not too bad idea because some of these antibiotics actually doesn't work. But anyway, so that's, that's a kind of medical uh, uh, way of looking at it. But I'm interested because just intellectual curiosity how this diagram uh, are actually occurring. Okay, so, but anyway, this P22 phage is the object that I will spend a few minutes with you, how we can use the cryo-EM to a microscope to look at these three-dimensional structures. And the last part of my talk, we'll talk about how do you look at the virus, these phages are, are multiplied in the cell. How do they look like? Because so far in this diagram, we biochemically purify it. So first of all, I can't like to share with you how we use the electron microscope to look at this mature phage. P22. So here is using this expensive camera, we take multiple frames and then afterward we uh, uh, line up the frame. Now as you get more frames, all the, these virus particles, 70 nanometer big, are become more and more pronounced. You can see that after 17 frames, things become more statistically defined. So you can see these particles different from these, this, 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 all slightly different because turn out these particles embedded in this matrix of eyes are oriented differently. If you look at me this way, it will be really look different from that way. So it's precisely why these particles don't like, look like this, even though they are identical virus particles. Now, so in our data uh, uh, collections, uh, this is some of the old data we did uh, some years ago. So we collect about 20,000 particles in the electron microscopes, and then we combine in computer, and then we generate these structures. And these structures, it actually look like uh, we call buckyball, and it turned out a buckyball is, uh, was, uh, uh, was a invention by Curl, Quoto, and, uh, and Smarty uh, in Texas, which I used to be in Houston, so they are all good friends of mine. They won the Nobel Prize in 1996 because they uh, discovered this buckyball. What the buckyball said is these are only carbon atoms in this simple case. It has uh, penton and hexon. There's 60 carbon in making up this buckyball. Now, in biology, in this P20 virus, it looks like exactly buckyball. It also has hexon, one, two, three, four, five, six, and also have a penton. Okay, so it also have 20 sets of this hexon uh, material plus uh, one penton uh, uh, material. So, so I call this P22 really a biological buckyball. Okay, in terms of geometry, they follow very precise geometry as the C60 carbon as, in, as, as discovered by Professor Smalley at Rice University. So now, uh, what this diagram shows you is about the, position, the density of the atoms, okay? So I'm going to show you a movie in the next slide to show you to spin it around, and I like to zoom in one of these 20 hexon in here. Now, the density are so good that I can use a computer graphic to color it. They're actually, there are six of them. There are six different color. Each of these are represent a string of, uh, uh, of amino acid to form a, a, a protein. So there are six identical proteins uh, to form this hexama. So I just need to, to say one word about the protein. Protein is a string of amino acids. Usually there are small size of protein and a big size of protein. In this case, it's about 40 amino acids. Now, in the natural amino acid makeup protein, there's only 20 different kinds. Just like alphabet, we have 26 alphabet, depends on 
what, what words you use and the different combination of alphabet. Uh, in the protein, you have 20 alphabets, and then it depends on what combination of those uh, amino acid alphabet to make uh, one dis uh, distinct proteins. So now the, the interest what we have in here is how these alphabet amino acids are being stringed together in three-dimensional space. It looks like pretty nice, good-looking spaghetti, but they actually a very well-defined spaghetti. It's not a random spaghetti in this string, okay? So now, then the question is, how do I show you exactly how the amino acid in one end of the molecule to the other end. You know, they don't, you know, the both end can be in any protein, can be close together, it can be very separate apart. So then that is what we call a modeling. So we use a procedure that we can actually, a computer procedure can trace uh, the, we call backbone, the spaghetti polypeptide, the amino acid connectivity, you know, they, from left to right, top to bottom, and the top. So, you know, this is a journey that the amino acid had put together uh, in order uh, to form a functional protein. Okay, so it's not a random. Now, if you are sick, like Alzheimer's, some of this, these proteins cannot fall uh, ex exactly. And that is why these, uh, some of the protein can, can get uh, uh, cause uh, disease. So, but in this virus, P22, that capsid protein uh, form this particular trace. Now, as I said, uh, this movie show you the connectivity from one end. You know, this N terminal, C terminal is on the other end. Uh, so then, in addition to the connectivity, you may ask, well, where are the atoms? You, did I say the, the protein are made of atoms? So the next movie show you where the atoms are. Okay, so now, we are now with this thread of, of amino acid, we build the model, which the model will describe where the atoms are, which we represent the atom uh, in different color, oxygen in red, and nitrogen uh, in, uh, in blue, and then the white color are the carbon. Because by and large, the protein molecule are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Okay, and sometimes we have also a sulfur as well. So here, I give you a model to describe the position of each of these atoms. So uh, in this particular case, there are about uh, several thousand, maybe four or five thousand, uh, and 40,000 uh, atoms altogether. So we are able to determine all this in three-dimensional space. So now, as I pointed out, these are made by hexon and penton in this in, in these fundamental unit. There are 60 of that that make up the whole of P22 phage. So now each of these density we can build a, a model. And when we separate in those models, it turns out even though each of these proteins is made up identically with the same chemical composition, but it's but the position of each atom are not exactly identical. Uh, because each of the protein are surrounded by slightly different chemical environments, okay? So, so that is what we display here, these uh, seven different colors where we superimpose it. This end of this, you can fray out differently in each of these proteins in making up this hexon and the penton, and this loop here also slightly different, which I'll explain in a minute why that's the case. So that complete about our journey in from making the, the virus, taking the pictures, and con we construct in three dimensional pictures, and then build a model. And, and then, so from here, our interest is exactly what are the interaction between the protein? Because remember that the proteins are to protect, uh, make a shell to protect the DNA. The, uh, DNA. So we've discovered that in this model, at the end of this end terminal, we present each color represent different pro the, the adjacent protein. So the question I was asking is how this protein being held together? It turned out is this tail in here, the red protein and the blue protein are the the protein between the, the adjacent hexon. They are being held together by the hydrogen bond. Okay, which is a very short distance, only a few enzymes. So that answer our first chemical questions, how these six protein molecules to form this hexon? 
And it turned out, in addition to some of the interaction, one of the great interactions are these hydrogen bond holding it. So in other words, uh, one, uh, one hand holding the other guy's hands, holding it together in a chemical sense. So that is our first discovery, how these proteins are being held in a stable way so that the DNA will sit comfortably inside the virus chamber. Now, the next question is, how are, what are the chemical interactions uh, between the protein uh, around the hexon. We are talking so far this hydrogen bond is the protein across the hexon, how one protein from hexon to the protein of another hexon. The next movie I'm going to show you is how each of the protein within a hexon uh, being stabilized together. So here I'm zooming in here again in a model and I'm putting up the amino acid uh, atoms as well. I'm zooming in the interface between one protein to its neighbor. And when we examine it, we discover that there are about eight different uh, particular chemical interaction we call uh, saw bridges. Uh, so that means this oxygen atoms in these amino acids are in there with the nitrogen. There's a special name for this amino arginine and uh, glutamic acid. So the distances form a, uh, a hydrogen, uh, uh, form a uh, ionic interaction. It's a charge-charge interaction. So what we learn from here is about between the interface of the protein within the hexon, they are charge and charge interactions. Now, why this is important? Now, if you have a virus infection, if you want to have a drug, the drug, what the drug can do is can disrupt the assembly of the protein. So if you have a way of, of disrupting uh, these types of chemical interaction, then the virus will be falling apart and then you are well again. Right? So that's a whole idea when you want to do structural analysis is to discover what are the chemistry involved with the protein-protein interaction in such a way that we can start thinking about a therapeutic intervention process uh, to disrupt the virus so that we will be well again. So, so I think this gives you a glimpse how we go from images to, to map to model to a chemical details. Now, as I saw in the cartoon, this one corner of this particle have some other proteins involved with the DNA encapsulation. So far, I didn't show you that because this particular first part analysis, I want to show you the detail of the shell, the buckyball shell, protein cell, how they organize and how they, how they maintain the stability. So if you, Trying to look at that, you know, somehow there's something sticking out here, as what the cartoon said. Okay, so this is a very noisy image, but we are able to actually, the next step with an other image analysis, we are able to give you uh, a structures about this. So I talk about the detail in here. So this one, I can actually cut it open, and then I begin to see there are additional new protein. There are one, two, three, four four protein instead of this capsid uh, protein shell. And I'm showing you each of these, like this blue protein, there's turned out to be six copy. They're crystal structures, known about that. I you call a protein data bank to get the model, you fit into each of these six protein, and this we call the needle, a free protein. And then on top of it, there's another I call purple protein. And they turn out to be 12 copies, and I go to the protein data bank that fit that, so I know this is purple protein. And then again, they make up the same, same chemical composition. Now I'm looking at this green protein. It also turned out to be 12 copy, a crystal structure also known in each of these proteins. And then now we spin around, it look like what, uh, what the uh, protein data bank looks like. So as a result, we can now combining information on the cryo EHR microscopy together with crystallography of some of the individual protein that uh, the crystal are able to crystallize and solve the atomic structure. So now we have a whole uh, atomic level description of this virus. And in the last movie, I show you that turned out to be 12 copies of this portal green protein, 12 copies of the hot purple protein, and 18 copies of the tail spike, and then three copies of this needle protein. 
All the GP is the name of the proteins, uh, according to the geneticists. And of course, there are DNA in there. I didn't have time to show you DNA. It turned out the DNA is a kind of form, a, a, a spoop inside uh, the chamber. So, uh, that pretty much finished what I want to tell you about these infectious P22 phages, which will infect the salmonella. Now, so this is a mature phage, but we are also interested, say, how would this virus look like before the DNA comes into the chamber of the virus? So then we can, that means in this we call pole capsid. Now, in this, as this cartoon say, uh, there are the blue protein, which I went into a detail to talk about, but there are also purple protein, and I also show you some of these uh, other protein in this vertex. So, so the next set of experiment we did is to look at the structure of this called pocapsid. And so here is the experiment. We also took images in this expensive uh, movie frame camera, and this one I show you now. One thing you notice is these look like more angular, the, the structure I saw, these look like more circular. Uh, it's not your, your eyesight burning, they're actually true. You know, the one on the left is more circular, and you look at more carefully, get a computer ruler, this actually is a, a smaller in diameter by around 80 angstroms. Okay, around eight nanometer uh, smaller in diameter. So the interesting question is, that means when the gen genome is packaged in the virus, the virus actually is swelling, okay? Before the DNA is skinny and wrong, once the genome got in, they're angular and fat. And the question is, how does it do it? Do they do chemistry or there's some mechanical motion? So stay tuned, the next movie, which I'm going to show you is about these structures on this one before the DNA is encapsulated. And this one I showed you in detail a while ago. And so now we did subject at the same data processing, you know, 20, 30,000 baht ago, and to process the data to get this particular density map. And then we then extract one of the protein in the next slide to show you. Uh, this is, turn, turn out, it's the same protein, okay? I color differently because this is the pocapsid. Is the, this protein uh, that is the structure when uh, the virus do not have do not have the DNA. This is the one I show you. This purple color uh, is the model of the protein after the DNA is encapsulated. As you look at it, you know this long tail are kind of flopping around in the mature. Uh, virus, whereas it's hidden somewhere at the back here, and then you look at this loop free thing, also slightly different. And in a technical term, we say there are structural changes, okay, conformational changes. And the question is how they make this conformational change, and this is a movie to which I morph this hexon. So this one is the mature variant, you can see these are a whole body movement. It's not just I'm not arm waving, both my arm and my foot, and it's all moving in such a way to accomplish these structural changes in the virus. So first in the mature variant, this whole closing up. Again, it's not surprising. After the DNA come in, the job of the protein is to protect the DNA. That's why they don't want their open. When it open, the outside in the cell, they are very aggressive enzyme, can chew up all the DNA. That's no good, right? So that is a design very carefully that once the protein in there, the protein under conformational change, protecting the genome. And secondly, the interface between the protein also different. So that means there's multiple conformational variations before and after the DNA is encapsulated. Now here is a movie to to show um, uh, to show uh, in the side view. You see this end terminal actually <coughs> flopping around a lot. So a lot of protein move, but they some of the protein move just a like hinge motion. But this one is definitely more than just a hinge motion. There's a lot of changes through the polypeptide uh, of the protein. So from that, 
Now, I just want to show you uh, that in, in, in the virus before the DNA come in, somehow the question is how they build the shell. And the protein itself does not form these 60 copies of these hexons. They actually need initially some protein to help. We call scaffolding protein. So these we're looking from outside, and then you use the computer to cut it, and just like watermelon, to look inside, they're red protein. Now, I just color it red, they are not red. Okay, so, so these turn out, these density red protein, we call scaffolding protein. And they are kind of one-to-one -one ratio. One scaffolding protein by one of the capsid protein to help the cell to build. So that means in this building process, to get the, 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 the whole, whole virus into a stable uh, buckyball, uh, before the DNA comes in, you need the assistance of this red protein called scaffolding protein. And now, as you saw the movie, that when the DNA comes in, some part is moving. The reason it's moving because some of this red protein has to get out, right? Because there's no space. When the DNA comes in, the scaffolding protein has to get out to let the DNA in. And that's why that last terminal uh, portion that you see the moving, moving around, that moving by one part actually was bound to this red protein in the, in the uh, procapsid form. But once it's mature, then the DNA uh, have to be released from the scaffolding protein, undergo this swelling to make it uh, 80 uh, and some uh, uh, wider capsid. So this uh, concludes uh, my presentations of how this virus after in two different conformational states. After the DNA come in, become infectious, I show you the structure of all the protein part, and also show you all the protein part before the DNA comes in. Now, all were done because we are able to purify these, each of these separately in the biochemistry laboratory. Now, what happened is say, well, why you are just in, in the ivory tower, you do things in the test tips, how real it is. I raised the same question to myself, right? My daughter asked me, Dad, what are you doing? You know, how, how useful you think doing? I said, oh, it's going to be useful one of these days. <laughs> uh, so now I'm showing you, now let's look at the whole cell, right? I'm looking at the whole cell, which had been infected by the virus. Is that real enough? I think it's real enough. So now, but the cell, as I show you in the scale diagram, they are about 100 times bigger than the virus, that means the, the, the bacteria cell can hold uh, uh, tens of this, this virus particle, okay, in addition to all the protein machinery in the bacteria. So now when I look at this, it turns out this particular cell is a bacteria cell in the ocean. We call cyanobacteria. Now, why is it interesting? Because in, it turns out that our whole bioecological system uh, we eventually come out the sun. The sun gives us the energy. The energy will convert into organic mass. And so it turns out in the ocean, it's full of shark, you know, a lot of fish and shark. But in addition, there are lots of bacteria swimming around as well. These poor bacteria, they may be eaten up by the shark. But anyway, I don't know that. Uh, so, but this particular uh, bacteria is useful from the point of view to understand what the most fundamental process in life is to capture the sunlight to make organic mass, okay? And number one. And number two, each of the bacteria in our cell, in, in the ocean, they are also associated with phages, okay? That is, in other words, these phages, in other words, if all the phages die, the bacteria will probably die also. If all the bacteria die, it turns out within us a lot of bacteria. Hopefully, we have all the other defense mechanism to make sure that the bacteria is not too offensive. Uh, so there's a kind of homostasis. So right now in the medical school, that you know, there are cancer patients. It turns out even the cancer patient, some of the complication is some of the bacteria that they call microbiome is not in balance. Okay, eventually one may die because of these uh, bacteria come kind of mess it up in terms of things. So now, when I look at this, this is about fractions of micron. They're very thick, 
Okay, so you see this. Well, what are you suing? It's just a black thing, you know. It's, I pay you my tax dollar. It's not worth it. So I said, don't worry. I probably can do some physics, which I muck around with this, putting a face page. In such a way, I get this. Compare, look at this and that from nothing to something. I'm not playing magic, but this is real. This is a real physics. Okay, so that means that's why we need physicists, right? Because they do good things sometimes, uh, most of the time. Uh, and uh, so, so, so we call a phase bay. Mr. Sonicki, who also got the Nobel Prize a long time ago in the light optics, invented this, but we applied it here to an optics. And so as a result of that, then we can look at this by we got tomography. It turned out every bacteria is different from any other bacteria. So no two bacteria are identical. So that means we need to get a 3D picture of one bacteria at a time. So the way we do it is in the microscope, we can actually rotate the specimen looking at different angles uh, so that you know, we can get multiple pictures. And then just like a CT scan, we get a tomogram reconstructed. And here is like in the microscope, we can tell this bacteria. Uh, and then again, before data processing, you don't see much. But now the next movie, I'm going to show you a tomographic reconstruction of the cyanobacteria infected by the cyanophages. Now you can see there are billions of protein molecules in here. You can see all kinds of features in here. This is the outline of these uh, cyanobacteria. All these are different protein machines. This round thing right here, uh, I'm, I'm zooming in at different height on these reconstructions. And so again, these are very congested informations. I'm now showing you a different representation of this uh, 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 cyanobacteria. I'm flipping it around in the tomogram in the computer uh, after the reconstructions. And then subsequently, I use a, a computer color pencils uh, by hand. These are the, we call the cell membranes. And then the call firecoin membrane is a photosynthetic reaction uh, reactions here. There's these cyanide color things are containing the, uh, the enzyme that fix the carbon dioxide in photosynthesis reaction. These are infecting phages. And finally, you see a lot of purple thing. These are newly born phages, newly synthesized phages that we were able to capture in this tomogram. So now you can imagine what I show you, what I, I color it, uh, is only a few of the highlights. You look at this. These phages actually drill a hole into this membrane to transfer its DNA into it, into the cell. So we do see uh, this one slightly leaking because there's too many phages in there. So it's slightly leaking. Some of the other things are, are going outside. So as you can see, the one I said color pencil, I really meant that. Uh, using a computer. So the color you saw, it took us a week to color it. Now, fortunately, I have a very diligent postdoc who was willing to do it. But after he, she did one, she said, why? I'm tired. I said, what do you mean tired? Work harder. He said, no, I'm politically incorrect. I should encourage loving care to my student and postdoc. So I said, OK. So in other words, maybe we don't need to work harder. Maybe we work smarter. So in fact, another student come by, they said, well, you don't need to stay there for one month, you know, to color it as a kid. And because I'm a graduate student, I'm from Stanford, I must be smart, right? So then, well, I was from Texas, so the stacks are also smart too, um, <laughs> in different way. Uh, and uh, so, so we eventually employed this, this algorithm called deep learning. Okay, deep learning is, 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 is the artificial intelligence. So we actually develop in such a way all the things we color, we can do the with the computer using in one hour time instead of one week human time. So, so it's really exciting. You know, when we first did this, it was really labor intensive. But now, you know, you can watch the football at the same time that the computer <laughs> color for you. Uh, students tend to do that. You know, there's intelligent people at Stanford. Uh, so now, in addition to this, I said, OK, let's be real. We are not only looking at the bacteria infected by the phages only in one time point. 
We need to do multiple time points. You know, like you get infected by bacteria, usually your temperature is okay, subsequently your high temperature, you know, because the phages are multiplying in you. So, so this is the experiment we did, and different time point, uh, it kind of equivalent to different time point. So at the beginning, there are no phages in there. Uh, when you infect it, there's some phages in the outside, and then at some stages, there are some inside and outside. At the end, there are plenty of newly uh, synthesized phages inside. So we can actually start sampling different data bonds equivalent to a different physiological steps. Okay. Now what I'm saying here, we cannot synchronize these in the infection, but getting a lot of data, we can here are the example uh, to show that. So then in here, then then all the purple beads here, I said they all look alike. I said maybe not. Let's look closer. Let's put on a magnifying glasses, computer magnifying glasses, look further. And again, thanks very much for the image data processing step in such a way that we actually was able in those tomograms to discover there are five types of particles. They look different. So one look roundish, and there's something inside. This is a, they got a cutaway wheel. This is the surface wheel. And then some you see something in one vertex. Some you look a kind of angular and have something inside. Some has a tail. And in this particular cyanophages, it turned out we call a horn on the opposite end. So in other words, in this vast amount of tomogram, using a computer sorting, aligning, and averaging, we are able to discover five particles of different size and shape. That's real, right? But it turned out in this project, which is different from P22, P22 is uh, infecting salmonella, this infecting the cyanobacteria, it has this horn. One of the questions uh, among these uh, phage biologists when does the horn get on uh, attached to these phages? By just look, uh, we have this assembly. The horn must be assembled the last. So as a result, we are able to figure out the pathway how this is being assembled. Okay, now interesting enough, this you actually see some density in here. I said that the DNA has to thread into the, into the chamber of the phages. It's no free meal, it takes energy. It turns out this is an enzyme provide the energy to package the DNA in there. Now it also turns out in these particular phages, we are able to only purify this. We were not able to purify all the other easily. So what it tells me is if I want to look at the structure of a biological process, in this case is the virus assembly, it's a it's a, in, fact, in a sense, an infection process of a pathogens. If we understand how this is assembled in this process, we can again start thinking about what drug we want to, to use to disrupt either at this stage to go from this or don't put up the horn at the end. Okay, now this only bacteria, uh, only the cyanobacteria, we don't need a drug for it, but if you can imagine, uh, it's a herpes virus or the Zika virus. Uh, which has similar types of buckyball arrangement of the protein, uh, we can think about a drug design or an antibody to neutralize uh, these kind of pathogens. So as a result of that, we can actually work out the entire pathway of the SMB from the pole capsid with the scaffolding protein, the, the DNA, and then in fact, if, you know, in, this, in, in this one here, this is smaller diameter than this. So this also show that the swelling of the capsid happened at the very onset of the DNA packaging. You know, the, one of the questions, when does it get swollen into 70 nanometer wider? It turned out when the DNA comes in, it starts swollen. Not all the DNA come in and swollen. So that's again a kind of mechanistic process we were able uh, to, uh, to delineate through this kind of thing. Now, so some of these processes could work out by genetic manipulations, but those are very tedious. So again, my mantra is just look in the nature. Everything, you just need to have a powerful yet microscope, a good computer, good software, I have lots of expensive software guys, you will have all problems solved. <laughs> and so finally, I kind of just like to summarize the opportunity for cryo-EM research in biomedical sciences. So what I show you is a phages, 
is a bacteria, but the same technology in my lab and many others can now apply to uh, mod uh, protein molecular machines that are relevant uh, to diseases. So I show you in the first two examples, we can actually resolve the atomic structure of a molecular machine, in this case phages, and which the phages can have different conformation in different physiological states, like the procapsid before the DNA comes in, and the bacterial phages after the DNA come in, the structures are different. We can do it without uh, involving crystallography. In fact, these phages have been tried by Christopher for many, many years. It was not able uh, to crystallize uh, to soft structure. So that's another why you are doing cryo EM and alternative procedure other than crystallography to give you atomic resolutions structures. Now, the other one, which I am particularly interested in looking toward the future, is to get an atomic resolution structure routinely to enable for drug design, en enzyme engineering, nanoparticle, and synthetic chemistry. Now, all these big words, but let's put it today. We are saying we need drug. Okay, a lot of drug companies are making drug. Before you make drug, you need to know the target, like in this case, a, a, a virus. And you need the structures. Once you need the structure, then you can intelligently think about where are the chemistry holding the protein together in the, in the protein machines, and in such a way we develop drug. So now, in this technology is now fast enough that it can be part of the pipeline in an academic environment uh, uh, or in industry of, of the pharma uh, to use this, this, this as a data bond uh, for a drug discovery process. And lastly, then what I'm excited about is we can directly visualize the molecular machine like the phages in situ, in the cell, okay, in the cell, either in a normal state and, and pathological state. I personally now, we have a project involving Huntington disease, uh, which Huntington disease are involved in the protein misfolding. So what we are interested in is if the, if the individual have those diseases, how would the cell look like? How they look different from uh, the individual don't have those diseases. So I think by understanding the underlying organization, structural organization, we hope to find solutions and therapies or, uh, or prevention medicines uh, or to, to overcome those diseases. I have two more slides to make you think, make I think, make, to convince you that actually drug design uh, is feasible. Now, in terms of drug design, what I show you is only three and a half, three point three angstrom. The the medicinal chemist say, "Wow, well, maybe that's not good enough because I really need to get a crystal clear each of these oxygen nitrogens atom." And can you go beyond three and a half angstrom? My answer is yes because you pay me well. Uh, so here, I came to Stanford, we set up a microscope. This is called apoferritin. Okay, apoferritin is another molecular machine that holds up all the iron. You know, some of you eat iron every day, you know, this, the peel, right? Because they are actually, this apoferritin can contain the iron to supply to the body. So these are the images of this apoferritin. And we solve the structure. Look like another nano cage. Now I color it four different colors this time. It turned out instead of uh, 420 uh, uh, protein, in this case only 24 proteins. Uh, so each color is one per peptide. And in fact, if I extracted, build a model, only one portion of peptide, we actually see really detailed. Like for example, this amino acid, okay, right here, we call a ring structure. At 1.9 enzyme, this aromatic residue look like donut. Donut had a hole in there. If a low resolution look like pancake, a pancake doesn't have a hole. So I think this kind of information is what the medicinal chemist would like, or the pharma looks like. So the good news is the cryo EM can actually generate this quite rapidly. And uh, Dr. K uh, Kaiming Zhang in, in our group were able to collect data of this sort uh, in 10 hours time to generate uh, enough data to create this kind of density. So I think the good news is this is technique finally come into place. That means the Stockholm Nobel Committee did it right.
this technique is actually mature. Not just for academic interests, have a translational value as well. Now, one more last point about looking in the cell, which I'm extremely passionate about, is I worked when I was in Texas working uh, with Professor uh, uh, Anil Sok, uh, who is a ovarian cancer uh, oncologist. So based on his studies, the ovarian cancer patients, the platelet is from the blood, uh, tend to be somewhat abnormal. This, the patients seem to be from Botex. So we, I suggest maybe we just look at it. Okay, so here are this first clinical research. So the clinical research I did actually from a patient sample. So uh, these are the normal subjects. Uh, in order to make it short, the interesting part are that this blue protein called microtubule. They can't wrap around the platelet uh, in the normal individual. The benign patient, they're still wrapping around but slightly broken up. But in the benign patient, the, all these microbes seem to be broken up. Okay, the interesting aspect about these observations is that if this cryo-Yechon tomography method can potentially be a diagnostic procedure, in my opinion. Okay, so it turned out ovarian cancer, just like many cancers, is very hard to know until you really at the terminal stage. So my idea is why every healthy individual just get a, a drop of blood every year, go to the doctor, and then put it in my microscope, we will tell you how good your play that looks like. Now, if it somehow goes something wrong, we will just warn you at half the time. So I think potentially it can be a diagnostic purpose. And it's interesting enough, according to uh, Dr. Zhou, in the ovarian cancer patient, the diagnosis are not very good with the, with the current uh, diagnostic uh, procedure. So just like many cancer, like prostate cancer, we thought PSA was good, but now we were told maybe not that precise. So I think the medicine is still a evolving uh, branch of, of sciences. So I think I personally feel uh, cryo yechon tomography may potentially have a role to put it in the clinics. And finally, and because all this excitement and Stanford University and SLAC decided uh, we need to do it in the right way to set up these kinds of research scenario and through the very generous support from the president of Stanford and the director of SLAC uh, and the dean of research and many faculty, we set up a cryo EM facility. It's only five minutes walk from here. And so we have all kinds of state-of-art instruments, and we have four high-end instruments. We have freezing apparatus, specimen preparations uh, in the building six. I really invite you, some of you, uh, in the future, just send me an email. You're always welcome uh, to come to visit us, just to take a look at how we operate in, in, uh, in uh, regular hours. I just want to point out why we are talking. Some of the people sitting at the back in my lab probably collecting data. In other words, some of these data collection can be done remotely. And so, in fact, uh, some of the project, uh, the postdoc uh, professor, uh, who will now become a professor now, um, uh, uh, Hung Ro, and he collected a data set on one of the channels in five days while he was attending a conference elsewhere. And that was a sensational data he got. So now, with all these uh, investment from Stanford and partly from the National Institute of Health. Uh, the National Institute decided they want to do, do not only people at Stanford can use it. Uh, he, uh, the NIH, the, through your tax dollar support, decided that we want to, this facility open to anywhere in America. So they pick up free sites, and we are one of the free sites, uh, to set up a national uh, uh, cryo EM center. And so we are going to open these centers up. We just got the funding about two months ago. And we are very excited that we will uh, double our capacity, not only for our own local use at Stanford and Slack. We also actually welcome anyone in America and beyond to come to use the facility. That we're going to be really exciting. There will be a lot of, uh, of biological material we can first time 
to look at the structure and function. Hopefully, it has a translational value uh, to overcome uh, the comeback diseases and also solve the, 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 uh, the alternative by uh, energy problems. And finally, all the work I present are many capable individuals. When I was in Texas, some of them actually moved along with me. Uh, that individual and the phase project was in long-term collaboration with Professor Jonathan King at MIT. Uh, you know, MIT just don't have these kinds of things, right? Uh, so we have been working um, with him for many years, so we are really excited uh, with all these uh, colleagues uh, in, in my group who contribute a lot of very de dedicated time for many, many months and years. Uh, to the story I present to you. I thank them and I thank all of you to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You'll take questions? Yeah, yes. Uh, so we are taping this show, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and then use the microphone in front of you. Uh, there's a button for that, press that. Questions? Yes. Yeah, you can just Maybe the button the is pressed. Um, what is the function of the horn on the virus? OK, what is the function of the hole uh, in the virus? In the pull capsid, it's as a hole. Because as I mentioned, there's scaffolding protein in the pole capsule. Somehow the scaffolding has to get out. Like some of the people get out right now. You know, they go to here, and, but if you want to get out, you need to go other way. Because the DNA go in the, the, the one entry, you cannot get out that way. So the hole allows the scaffolding protein to get out. Excellent question. Uh, hi, so you mentioned that it takes about 10 hours per sample. Is that all the way from the protein biochemistry to the uh, 3D structure, or is that just uh, dedication? Okay. So this case is an extremely lucky case, just like anything, you know. Some of the project we need even days and months, we still don't get close to it. So this particular apoferritin turns out is a well-behaved protein machine. Uh, so after we purify it, uh, then we, we freeze it, you know, purify probably takes X hour, more than 10 hours. And then freezing it is pretty quick, it's 30 minutes. And then in this case, uh, we only use this automatic data collection in 10 hours. We were able to get this. And in fact, if we do only one hour, if we are lazy, uh, then we get 2.4 answers. No free meal, so you need to work harder to get better resolution. <laughs> So I have a question about water. So you have oxygen in your image. How do you subtract out the water oh. background? And then also, does when you freeze it, does the water bonding affect the structure and, and alter what you see? Very good questions. OK. Uh, it's, uh, when you freeze it, when the water is frozen, it turns out water can have different phase transitions. It can be crystalline water. It can be amorphous water. You know, the water mo molecule H2O can form a crystals. Uh, so the way we did it, uh, Shock to Boucher, who got the Nobel Prize, was because he was able to freeze it very quickly in a very efficient uh, cryogen called ethane, liquid ethane. So when we first did it at Berkeley with my mentor, Professor Bob Grazer, we froze it in liquid nitrogen. It turned out in liquid nitrogen, it was not frozen fast enough, so the water become a crystalline ice, and then Sartre-Boucher changed that method using ethane, and then you can froze very, very quickly, and uh, the speed is something like 10 million degrees per second, that quick. And so the water will be in amorphous ice form, okay? And that's how to keep the specimen uh, hydrated and, and preserved well. Did I answer your question? The, the other part of it was, how do you keep the oxygen, even from amorphous, from showing up in your image? Is it just it's random enough? Oh, 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 OK. So one of the thing is, you may be asking, do we see water in our map? OK, I didn't have a slide. And in fact, we did 
at the 1.9 angstrom VC water molecule. And the question is, how good the resolution you can see water molecule? In our experience, if you have something like 2.5 angstrom resolution, you will begin to see the water. Now, water is so little, then one of the things I didn't uh, tell you is, how can you trust me what I said, okay? <laughs> After all, I came from Texas, right? So <laughs> they, they were a good state. Uh, so I think this is a good question. So that our community in the cryo EM community, we are very concerned. How do we think what we see is what, what actually is? So we, we undergo a lot of validation procedures. Uh, there are computational procedures to allow us to validate what we see is actually what we mean. And so, uh, so our experience at two, uh, so one of the way that a couple of structure we did, uh, uh, they also accompany X-ray crystal structure. They also saw water, and and X-ray is such crystallography is such a well established procedures. So even though some of them are not quite right as well, but. Uh, but in this case, if they see the water, we see the water, at least we are converging. Now, we could be both wrong in an absolute sense, uh, but then we need to interpret uh, in terms of the chemistry. One of the things I did not talk about, which are the example, if you have an enzyme reactions, okay, uh, which will involve water oftentimes, and whether the water at the right place uh, during that enzymatic reaction, that's important. So in addition to a, a very rigorous uh, validation based on the structural procedure, we also need to make sense in terms of functions. And then, and then other thing we do is also we can do mutagenesis. We can modify certain residue in such a way water won't get close to it, and we can do another structure. And then that, that water molecule or whatever ligand. And in fact, we also, uh, one of the projects on an ion channel, we begin to see not only water, uh, but we can see the fat, the lipids in, 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 in the complex as well. Great. Hi, Watt. Uh, Hi. Very exciting work. Um, how important is uh, the knowledge of your protein sequence uh, to get these sub-2 angstrom structures? Okay, so most of the projects we do, uh, we are kind of know what are the chemical compositions. And, and most of them actually have a gene sequence and also accompany with the protein sequence. So in terms of the building block amino acids, we can't know in most cases. But the question is, do we really know everything we see? in there. The answer is we already come across two cases. We actually discovered something we didn't know before. Okay, so in one of the case we thought it's only one protein. It turned out there's another protein, a small protein. It escaped, uh, it escaped the, uh, the, the, the knowledge of, of the biochemist who thought it's only one protein. When we finish all this structure and we build the model, we build the model according to what we were told, how many amino acids in the protein. And we saw, oh, there's another density. I want our amino acid, what's that? It turned out it's another protein. And that triggered us to do another biochemistry experiment uh, or another genetic experiment to confirm what we suspect another protein indeed is another protein. We already come across two cases, but it's an expensive way of discovering another protein. <laughs> but that's okay. It's very powerful techniques. Sorry. Uh, thank you for the very nice presentation. I have a question. So during your presentation, luckily um, your cryo EM structure actually matched with the X-ray crystallography. Oh x-ray uh, structure. So what do you do when those two structures don't match? Oh, good question. In fact, sometimes they don't match. And then who's right? And I would say all of us are right for different reasons. Because it's correct, because in the x-ray case, they're very rigorous, right? And they get 1.5 and some they see every atom very clearly. But in the x-ray case, you need to crystallize the protein. 
So that means you need the protein in a different chemical environment. By crystallizing it, you cannot just embed it in ice. You need to put some other chemical. Which chemical don't exist in the cell, but they are doing chemistry. But we are doing biochemistry. So we are interested in the bio thing. Okay, so that's what we are after the truth, the ground truth, in the native structures. So we embed it in the chemical environment that we mimic in the cell. So as a result of that, now the Christophe actually get interest to do the cryo EM. Because what the structure they see, you know, they see how the spaghetti are being folded in 3D. Those have to be right. Okay. But in the counter chemical environment that we are in the cell or in solution, they may be different. So that's why now usually the Christophe also begin to do the cryo EM to keep them the structure, put that in context. Sorry, to follow up on that, um, is there a third technique to verify cryo-EM? Because it sounded like um, if, the, if those two structures do not match, um, the current convention is now to just trust the cryo-EM structure. Yeah, that's uh, social media, so you tend to do that. <laughs> Which I have no problem. But, but on the other hand, I already confess that in our community, we have to be self-disciplined. That means we have to establish very rigorous validation procedures. Okay, you know, I show you all these color shiny thing, you know, we always misled by all these color good looking thing, uh, but they can be wrong. I mean, in fact, some of the cryo EM structure in the literature are not entirely right. We are, just like any science, it's not they are cheat or anything, it's just, that if they have not followed a very rigorous procedure, they may be overinterpret on the data. And we did see that, just like any field of sciences. With the um, huh. suggestion of using the imagery for, for pharma, is there a way to know, like with the salt bridges, that you're also not attacking healthy proteins that may have the same mechanism? Yes, yes. You can go either way. You can mess it up the salt bridges, but you can build new salt bridges. You can go either way. Depends on the circumstance. Are you from the farmer? Good. We'd be happy to talk to you. Hi, I actually have a series of questions. Not that many, three, if you wouldn't mind engaging in a small conversation. Um, how long is the wait list for the users to gain access to these microscopes? Oh. What's the average wait time? Uh, you mean here locally? Yes, through your facility. Well, we actually have developing a, a more, uh, with the new center we have from NIH, uh, we, will, we will organize in the same way as the Synchrotron X-ray beam line. Uh, that the individual investigator need to propose, make a proposal, and we have an independent expert to evaluate the proposal, not me, so we to be fair and unbiased. And then they will score the proposal, and then we see, it's only 24 hours a day, right? So right. X project need to be X, Y hours. And then so we allocate that, and uh, depends on the merits uh, of the projects, and then they will run accordingly. Uh, so that is what we are going to do. Uh, but at, right now with the instrument we have, uh, uh, so we have currently have sufficient uh, resources to accommodate the need of the people on campus and Slack. And I run a couple of NIH center, which I have to take care of a last constituents. Like for example, I just finished writing a report. Uh, we have. The operation was started in January of this year. In seven months' time, uh, we have 32 principal investigators, professors from different parts of the world, and we have solved 20 new structures out of these 32. And so nobody feel unhappy yet. <laughs> uh, so uh, I actually try to accommodate as many people. I mean, in fact, we are running the instrument 24-7. Right. It's nonstop. And the reason I ask, 
the reason I ask is for the following two questions, which is based on the data, the amount of output that you have, given the four microscopes that you have and running them 24 hours a day, it sounds like one of the major blockers in being able to produce is the availability or the time it takes to, to produce an image. So my question to you is, do you have any vision or insight into ways to improve it, the time it takes to produce? Good question. So I think there are two, there are two ways, the multiple ways of doing it. Uh, one is to increase the throughput. Uh, so one way, if you have a camera that can collect the data faster, is one way. Another, you can manipulate the beam, uh, make sure the beam still good quality, but at the same time get good quality images. Uh, and the third way is I need to pass the head. If you have any money, we can buy another <laughs> microscope. Uh, that would probably be the quickest way. Uh, so, so there are multiple ways uh, to approach that. So, so be sure to tell your friends to uh, recommend you for the Nobel Prize when you come up with those improvements, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the last question is, um, where do you see this technology or what you're currently doing uh, going? What's the vision for the next five, Okay, 10? so I think it is going to be, right now only those people you know, the biophysicists doing this. You, you may want to ask, what are the, what are the limiting factors to use the technology? It turns out is to making the proteinish material. You know, what I show you, this virus, is because Professor Jonathan King, you know, he was very good in making, purify this virus. He made perfect virus for this technology. I mean, we work on this project for 30 years before. We start with about like 50 angstrom resolution when we first started, now to free angstrom. You know, it's a long way. But his virus is always good, but our technology is not quite there yet. Uh, so I think what I think the challenges is the biology had to learn how to make the specimen so that we can put in the microscope. Like, this afternoon, there's a pathology from the medical school who came to talk to me, and he was interested in a, in a protein that has to do with hepatitis virus that causes liver cancer disease. And so, and the questions I have is, can, you, can he make good protein so that we can do this kind of high-resolution work? So I think that can be a challenge for some of these. But I would say there should not be a fundamental limitation. We just, nobody yet work on the biochemistry of that particular protein. Again, if we put the right people, that can be solved. So, uh, so I'm very optimistic. There are chemical ways in making the protein to be amenable for these methodologies. Uh, so um, I can see this technology will be a a regular data point on any biological research because like the synthetic biology, you want to synthesize new protein to do new things, new protein machine do new things, we need to characterize it. And in fact, this cryogenic EHR microscopy is not only useful for biological sample, it can be useful for non-biological sample like uh, beam sensitive materials uh, for example, uh, one of the professors in the, in, on campus is interested in alternative material to make battery. How can you make battery cheaper and last longer? And so, so but turn out those materials are very beam sensitive. So again, we can use this cryogenic EHR microscopy to, to look at those materials to aid the design of a perhaps a better and cheaper and last longer battery. Uh, battery material. So I can see these methodologies not only for basic research that I'm talking about, uh, could be material science research as well in the medical school. I think, you know, it just, you think about how many medical schools in America, maybe a hundred maybe. So I don't think there are yet only a handful of medical schools have this kind of facility. Uh, so I can imagine that would become a commonplace. Now, how many hospitals in America? There are many, right? If my, if my prediction is correct, can be a, a, um, can be a, uh, a diagnostic thing. You know, just like a CT scan, they're expensive. Nobody asks me how much it costs in each of these. It's very expensive. Uh, you know, it's, it costs more than a house in Parato. Uh, so... Uh, Maybe around in the Atherton area uh, house. <laughs>
prize for microscope. Shall we thank Professor Vachu again for a wonderful talk?